Allah Barakatuhu. Myself, Dr. Muhammad Imran, and uh, the topic for today's session is hemostasis in oral surgery. Now, firstly, the reason for choosing this topic is uh, bleeding or hemorrhage is one of the most uh, feared complications in dental practice, if not the most feared complication. Now, as a dentist, we do take precautions to avoid such complications, but we do not have an absolute control over uh, the occurrence of such complications. So when such complications do in fact occur, does it make the operating surgeon a bad surgeon? Now this mainly like uh, uh, is for the junior dentists and uh, my younger colleagues who, who are practicing out there. Uh, we should not get demotivated uh, when we are faced with a complication. Every surgeon, even the one with years of practice, does encounter an occasional surgical complication. There is a saying that there are two types of surgeons who do not encounter a surgical complication. One who do not operate and the others who are not quite fully truthful about it. So thereby what's important is how do we manage the complications? They say that good surgeons operate well but the great surgeons know how to manage their complications. Now, the complication that we are talking about here is bleeding. So in order to understand and manage this complication, we have to understand certain basic concepts about hemostasis, the conditions where we will encounter bleeding and how do we manage them. So for the ease of understanding, I have divided uh, the webinar into small three parts where in the first part we'll be looking at the basics of uh, hemostasis and in the second part we'll try to look at the management of patients on antiplatelets and anticoagulants and lastly some hemostatic agents uh, that we use in dentistry so coming firstly to hemostasis by definition it is a spontaneous arrest or stoppage of bleeding from an injured blood vessel by a physiological process. Now, mainly there are three processes which aid in hemostasis. One is vasoconstriction. As you can see in the first image, the blood vessel constricts or you can also call it a vasospasm. In the second image, you can see that there is a formation of temporary hemostatic plug. And finally, the temporary hemostatic plug is converted into a definitive plug. We will not get into the very details of hemostasis, but we'll just have a small overview of the steps. So the hemostasis can be basically divided into primary and secondary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis mainly deals with vasospasm and formation of a temporary platelet plug. Now this platelet plug that forms does not have a very good strength. Thereby it's a, it's a temporary sealing of the wound that happens which is further stabilized by secondary hemostasis, which results in the more formation of a more definitive fibrin clot. Now we can link this primary hemostasis to, to a foundation. The temporary platelet plugs lay a foundation upon which a definitive fibrin clot, that is, you, you, it, it is upon this uh, foundation of platelets that a definitive uh, platelet, uh, definitive fibrin clot is formed. So primary hemostasis basically has four steps. That is adhesion, activation, aggregation, and uh, formation of the platelet plug. Uh, the yellow colored structures that you see in the image are the platelets. And at the bottom of the slide, the pink colored structures that you see is the exposed collagen. Whenever there is an injury, the platelets attach to that collagen via one willy band factor and they change their shape as you can see and they release certain factors which help to attract more platelets to the site and thereby forming a temporary platelet plug platelet aggregate or attached to each other by fibrinogen so this results in formation of a temporary platelet plug which seals the wound this is followed by secondary hemostasis which converts this temporary platelet plug into a more definitive fibrin clot. Now, there are different uh, uh, mechanisms for uh, this secondary hemostasis. Mainly, we have the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. Now, 
both these pathways, what they do is they ultimately lead to the formation of a prothrombin activator. Now this prothrombin activator converts prothrombin to thrombin along with calcium. And this thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin. So what's the important part here about the secondary uh, hemostasis is the formation of the fibrin, which results in the formation of a fibrin mesh. So both the pathways, intrinsic and extrinsic, lead to the formation of a prothrombin activator, which converts prothrombin to thrombin, and thrombin finally converts fibrinogen to fibrin, which eventually results in a fibrin mesh. So this is about uh, uh, hemostasis. Now, coming to the conditions where we will encounter bleeding, there are a variety of conditions where uh, we may encounter bleeding, such as uh, disorders of platelets, thrombocytopenias, that is, disorders of coagulation, such as hemophilia, liver dysfunctions, and alteration in platelet function, such as von willi band disease. But today, uh, mainly what we will focus upon is uh, the use of uh, therapeutic uh, antiplatelets and therapeutic anticoagulants. The therapeutic antiplatelets that we commonly come across in dental practice is aspirin and clopidogrel. And therapeutic anticoagulants that we commonly come across in dental practice is warfarin and heparin. Now, what, what do these drugs do? They basically reduce the ability of the blood to form blood clots or coagulate. Now these drugs exert their effect at different stages of coagulation process. That is why we, we just had a small overview of hemostasis to understand this aspect of it. Now the management of these patients is challenging because we should balance the risk of bleeding which may occur uh, from the procedures that we perform and the risk of thromboembolic complication that may happen because of stopping of these medicines. So there are different conditions that require anticoagulation therapy, such as deep vein thrombosis, stroke, myocardial infarction, pulmonary thromboembolism, prosthetic valves, ischemic heart diseases, coronary bypass surgery, etc. So, uh, coming to the antiplatelets, uh, we have different antiplatelet drugs such as aspirin, clopidogrel, diclopidin, and dipyridomole. More commonly, uh, that we come across is aspirin and clopidogrel. So we will go back to that step of hemostasis where the platelets attach to the exposed collagen and release a certain factors which help in aggregation. One such factor is thromboxane A2. Now aspirin, what it does is it acts on arachidonic acid. Uh, it acts on cyclooxygenase 1, which converts arachidonic acid into prostaglandin H2. And prostaglandin H2 is further metabolized to thromboxane A2. Thromboxane A2 helps in aggregation. It, it brings the platelets to the mm -hmm. site and helps in platelet aggregation. Thereby, by uh, blocking the cyclooxygenase, we are preventing the formation of thromboxane A2 and thereby preventing platelet aggregation. Clopidogrel, on the other hand, how it acts is it uh, inhibits the attachment of ADP, that is adenosine diphosphate, to P2Y2 L receptor, which in turn inhibits the activation of G2B3 A receptor, which is required for cross-linking of the platelets to each other via fibrinogen. Mainly what we need to understand here is basically clopidogrel prevents the cross-linking of platelets to each other via fibrinogen. So now as we can see, these two drugs have the different mechanism of action. And a lot of times in clinical practice, we encounter uh, patients who are taking both the drugs. So when the patients are taking both the drugs, that is aspirin and clopidogrel, which have a different mechanism of action, it results in a synergistic effect. Now, what is this synergistic effect? By synergistic effect, what we mean is that these two drugs, when taken together, the effect that is produced is higher than when they are taken individually. So the risk of bleeding may be more in patients taking both aspirin and clopidogrel because of the synergistic effect. And coming to the anticoagulants, mainly the heparin and the warfarin. Uh, coming firstly to heparin. Heparin, what it does is heparin and the low molecular weight heparins, they act on something called as antithrombin-3. 
Now, this antithrombin-3 is a naturally occurring anticoagulant in the body. This antithrombin-3, what it does is it acts on factor 10A and uh, fact, uh, thrombin and inactivates them. Now, factor 10A and thrombin are required for formation of fibrin. So, thereby by inhibiting factor 10A and thrombin, it uh, uh, results in an anticoagulant effect. Now, heparin, what it does is it accelerates or potentiates the effect of antithrombin 3 and thereby resulting in inactivation of factor 10A and thrombin. Low molecular weight heparin, on the other hand, have a selective effect only on factor 10A. In cases where uh, we encounter excessive bleeding with patients on heparin, there is a reversal agent uh, that is available that is protamine sulfate. Next is the warfarin. Warfarin is mainly a vitamin K antagonist. That is, it inhibits the formation or uh, formation of vitamin K dependent coagulation factors. There are 13 coagulation factors as we all know. And there are four such coagulation factors that are dependent on vitamin K. That is 2, 7, 9 and 10. Warfarin, it inhibits the uh, formation of uh, active form of this coagulation factors, thereby it results in an anticoagulant effect. Unlike heparin, uh, warfarin does not have uh, an antidote as such, but when there is bleeding uh, in patients with heparin, uh, with warfarin, vitamin K uh, can be given, but a vitamin K takes about 24 hours to reverse the effects of warfarin. So thereby, if it is an emergency, uh, if, if, if it's an emergency situation where you are encountering bleeding with patients on warfarin, it is advised to give fresh frozen plasma. Now, coming to the assessment of bleeding risk, once these patients come to our practice, uh, patients who are taking these medicines, how do we go, go ahead managing them? First and most important is, uh, is a proper history taking. Now, uh, not only should we ask the patient about the medications that they are taking and for what they are taking, but also we should look at the associated comorbidities that may be present uh, uh, that may uh, further potentiate the risk of bleeding, such as patients may be having a liver disorder or liver dysfunction or a renal dysfunction. So uh, such things have to be taken into account. And secondly, uh, we should ask them about previous exposure uh, to a dental extraction or even any trauma which has resulted in excessive bleeding. So previous exposure of the patient uh, to any surgery or any trauma will give us an idea as to how the patient has reacted to a uh, situation where bleeding has been encountered. Next, we will assess the risk of bleeding, uh, which we will have a look at it in the next slide. And finally, we will order some investigations. So, uh, the dental procedures that we do uh, have been classified into procedures that are unlikely to cause bleeding, procedures that have a low risk of post-operative bleeding, and procedures that have a higher risk of post-operative bleeding. Procedures that do not carry a risk of bleeding include local anesthesia, either by an infiltration or by a nerve block, periodontal examination, supragingival scaling, any restorations which have supragingival margin, uh, impressions and fitting and adjustment of orthodontic appliances. This do not carry a risk of bleeding. Procedures that carry a low risk of bleeding are simple extraction with restricted wound size. By restricted wound size, what we mean is that uh, the extraction sockets are not adjacent to each other. We are not extracting, say, six and seven. We are probably extracting a six and a, a premolar. So the wound size is limited incision and drainage of intraoral swellings, subgingival scaling, restorations that have subgingival margin, this all carry a low risk of post-operative bleeding. And the procedures that carry a high risk of bleeding are comp complex extractions, that is adjacent extractions that will cause a large wound, any flap raising procedures such as impactions, apicectomies, implant surgery, uh, alveoloplasty, that is a pre-prosthetic surgery or periodontal surgeries and biopsies. These all procedures carry a high risk of bleeding. So once uh, we, uh, uh, we assess that what 
procedures we are going to do, uh, whether it falls under a low risk or a higher risk category. Uh, next comes the investigations we will order. Activated partial thromboplastin time, it mainly assesses the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. Prothrombin time and international normalized ratio assess the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. Now, intrinsic norm, uh, international normalized ratio is normally used uh, for patients who are, uh, who are on anticoagulant therapy. It is basically derived from prothrombin time. It is a ratio of prothrombin time of the patient to a control prothrombin time raised to the power of international sensitivity index. The normal INR in a healthy individual who is not on any medications is 0.9 to 1.1 or 1.2. And the therapeutic range, once the patient is on anticoagulant for any condition, uh, such as a uh, pulmonary thromboembolism or a stroke, so uh, a therapeutic range of anticoagulation is established for them, which is in the range of 2 to 4. So we'll come to patients who are taking a single or dual antiplatelet therapy. Now, a range of antiplatelet drugs are available uh, to treat cardiovascular and cerebrovascular uh, systems. Now, these drugs can be taken individually, such as a uh, patient may only be on aspirin, or it can be taken as a dual antiplatelet therapy where the patients may be on a combination of drugs such as aspirin and clopidogrel. Now, there, there are studies that suggest that uh, there is more risk uh, of thromboembolic complications by stopping these drugs. And uh, as compared to a low risk of bleeding that we may encounter during performing uh, low risk procedures. So one such article I would like to quote given by Bajkin et al. in British Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. He conducted a study to evaluate the effect of single and dual antiplatelet uh, treatments on post-operative bleeding in patients having dental extractions. He concluded that the patients taking a single or dual antiplatelet drug may have their teeth safely extracted without interruption of treatment using only hemostatic measures. Now, this, this is recommended for a low risk procedures uh, that were mentioned and when we come to uh, patients taking oral anticoagulants there are five different approaches that have been suggested one is cessation of oral anticoagulant therapy that is completely stop the oral anticoagulant therapy before the procedure second is where you stop the oral anticoagulant therapy and bridge it with heparin in the third scenario you bridge it with low molecular weight heparin. In the fourth, you can decrease the dose of oral anticoagulant. And finally, maintenance, that is you will perform the procedures without any alterations in the oral anticoagulant therapy. Now, in patients who are at low risk, uh, the warfarin is stopped five days prior to therapy and no bridging as such is indicated. In patients who are on medium risk or high risk, uh, the bridging is recommended. Now, the bridging can be done using either a low molecular weight heparin or heparin. If it's a low molecular weight heparin, it has to be discontinued 24 hours before the procedure. And if it's a heparin infusion, it has to be discontinued four to six hours before the procedure. Now, <clears throat> uh, mainly like... Uh, both warfarin and heparin are anticoagulant drugs. So why do we have to bridge it? Why do we have to stop a warfarin and shift it to a heparin or low molecular weight heparin is the question. Now, uh, warfarin has a long duration of action and uh, it has uh, the reversal of the anticoagulant effects also takes a long time. And when we stop, the warfarin say about a week before the surgery the patient uh, will not be anticoagulated anticoagulated for that period of time which increases the risk of thromboembolic complications thereby bridging is considered with short acting anticoagulant so that the patient can be anticoagulated and it is stopped just before the surgery so that hemostasis can be achieved now the disadvantage with 
heparin as such is that the patient has to be hospitalized because it has to be given as an IV infusion. With the advent of low molecular weight heparins, uh, this is becoming a, a choice of treatment where uh, it, it can be injected subcutaneously uh, instead of giving it IV. Now, uh, different uh, recently, uh, what they have suggested is that uh, there is no need to, to bridge. There is no need to shift the patients from warfarin to heparin and there is no need to stop warfarin. Procedures can be performed uh, safely using local hemostatic measures uh, with patients having INR even up to three or four. One such article is by Morimoto Y et al. who conducted a study to examine the hemostatic management of tooth extractions in patients on oral antithrombotic therapy. In this study, the subjects comprised of 270 patients with 134 receiving warfarin alone 49 receiving warfarin with additional antiplatelet drugs and remaining 87 only uh, receiving antiplatelet drugs. Now in this, all the teeth were extracted without reducing the usual antithrombotic therapy and oxidized cellulose was applied and suturing was performed for local hemostasis. Now they concluded that a sufficient hemostasis can be obtained in most cases of tooth extraction under anticoagulant therapy with warfarin uh, with an INR even up to three, and even if there, it is in combination with the antiplatelet drugs. Febo et al. Uh, in another study concluded that patient taking an anticoagulant with INR lower than 2.2 have a similar risk of bleeding as a normal control patient, and the risk was approximately one in 40 in those with INR 2. Point, with uh, uh, INR of 2.2 to 3. Whereas the risk in patients with an INR higher than 3 was approximately 1 in 11. So they suggested that uh, the extractions can be safely uh, carried out with the use of uh, local hemostatic measures to control bleeding. Now we have been talking about the local hemostatic measures till now. So we will just have a look at what are these uh, measures that, that we can use to manage bleeding. So whenever we are encountered with a complication, the most important thing is not to panic. We have to think and we have to follow an algorithm. We have to follow a stepwise approach to control bleeding. We should not rush to emergency measures of controlling bleeding immediately. We should follow a stepwise approach. There are different methods that can aid in hemostasis. Uh, we will only speak about uh, the methods that we can uh, apply in the clinical setup. So thereby thermal agents such as electrocautery cryosurgery and lasers, I will not be focusing on that. Uh, we'll mainly be talking about the mechanical methods and the chemical methods. Mechanical methods being digital pressure, suturing, and chemical methods being the use of chemicals such as adrenaline, thrombin, gelatin sponge, surgicel, styptics, bone wax and austin. Now the first method uh, that we always use whenever there is a bleeding is the application of digital pressure. Now the digital pressure can be applied to the socket using a, a wet saline wet gauze, uh, uh, gauze piece so that uh, the gauze threads do not attach to the wound. Uh, it will be packed inside the own and the patient will be asked to apply pressure on it now important thing is to be to be patient here like we should not rush to check if the uh, bleeding has stopped every 30 seconds wait for a few minutes to allow uh, the bleeding to stop uh, next method it was uh, given by uh, one of the surgeons from karnataka gururaj arakeri uh, povidone iodine we use uh, uh, to achieve hemostasis normally in a clinical setup where we use a gauze uh, that is soaked in povidone iodine. Uh, here, uh, what they have suggested is to use a mixture of povidone iodine and hydrogen peroxide mixture. And uh, uh, they use a mixture of uh, 50 ml of povidone iodine and uh, 10 ml of hydrogen peroxide. Okay, they say an efficient hemostyptic prop, uh, uh, property of the solution may be because of the formation of hydrogen iodide, which has a corrosive effect on the tissue. The iodine uh, has a, 
it, it cauterizes it, it acts as a chemical uh, cauterization and helps in achieving uh, hemostasis and they also say that because of uh, the pressure uh, once you place the gauze and ask the patient to bite it may also aid in mechanical hemostasis like similar to applying digital pressure the next is hemocoagulase now this is a fractional isolate of snake venom now it accelerates the formation of fibrin monomers which is required for formation of a fibrin mesh and hastens the fibrin clot formation you can take about 1 cc or 1 ml of uh, hemocoagulase on a gauze and place it in the socket uh, and ask the patient to bite on it to achieve hemostasis next is the gelatin sponge uh, gelatin sponge is uh, available as abgel uh, this what you see uh, uh, we, we we get something called as a dental abgel uh in which uh, the size of the abgel is such that it can be placed into an individual socket in this type of abgel you have to cut it and then you have to place it into the socket now this gelatin sponge uh, the uh, mechanism is that it it has the ability to absorb blood it can absorb blood up to 40 times its weight and it can expand up to 200 times its size so what it does is uh, by expanding it it exerts pressure on the alveolar walls and thereby aids in mechanical hemostasis and also it being a porous material it acts as a scaffold for uh, a blood clot to form upon it so what we need to do is we need to pack a gelatin sponge into the alveolar uh, into the socket and then we can uh, secure this gelatin sponge using a figure of 8 suture the next uh, hemostatic agent is surgicel now this gelatin sponge uh, that we saw is uh, uh, economical it it comes at a price of approximately 300 for 10 pieces of dental abgel surgicel on the other hand is a little costlier uh it is available at a price of 1300 to 1350 uh this what it does is it has an acidic ph so when it is added uh, uh to the socket it causes because of the acid, uh, acidic ph it causes the lysis of the red blood cells and it causes a coagulation it causes a uh, blood clot uh that is not a physiological blood clot it causes a pseudo blood clot because it is not causing any physiologic changes in the body it is causing lysis of the red blood cells and thereby causing a pseudo clot formation that happens with surgical cell and because it has a low ph it is considered that it has bacteriostatic property also we have some uh product called as hemcon dressing uh, that is a chitosan product uh, we personally have have not used this uh, but uh, there is there there is good literature available on this uh, product and its efficacy in controlling bleeding now this is a naturally occurring polysaccharide it has an electro positive charge so what it does is that it attracts the negatively charged red blood cells resulting in formation of a viscous coagulum and it also acts as a scaffold upon which a blood clot can form moncel solution moncel solution it is basically a ferric subsulfate it is uh, a styptic it it can be used for uh, small soft tissue lacerations or small uh, bleeding from the soft tissue following biopsies it can be applied to the tissue using a cotton applicator now the disadvantage with moncel solution is it causes uh, pigmentation of of the tissue now some some agents that are specific for bone such as bone wax now bone wax is a combination of waxes such as beeswax paraffin wax and certain softening agents now bone wax as such does not have any uh hemostatic property what it does is it acts by occluding 
occluding the marrow spaces from where it is bleeding. So what you need to do is you need to take this wax and uh, you, you can place it in a little warm water. You can knead it and you can apply it directly over the bleeding site. Uh, similar to like if, if, if you people have used something called as M seal, how we plug, how we plug the water leakage, it is it is something you can say similar to similar to that. The disadvantage with this is that uh, uh, it acts as a foreign body, and thereby uh, sometimes uh, there is a uh, it, it may act as a nidus of infection, and there is also uh, a risk that there may be a foreign body granuloma formation. Uh, around this uh, bone wax. Now, the product that is available as an alternative to bone wax is Austin. Uh, this product, again, uh, like uh, I have not uh, used, uh, but uh, it, it has all the benefits uh, or all the, it covers all the uh, disadvantages of the bone wax, such as uh, it, it is biocompatible, it is made of uh, naturally occurring alkaline polymers. It does not uh, stay at the site for more than 48 hours. It resorbs easily and also it does not uh, have any risks of foreign body granuloma formation as such. So coming to some systemic agents uh, that we can use, one is uh, tranexamic acid and ethamsalate. Tranexamic acid, what it does is uh, it prevents the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. plasmin uh, acts on fibrin and causes the breakdown of the clot. As we all know that fibrin is necessary for the stabilization of the clot and plasmin acts upon fibrin to result in degradation of fibrin. So tranexamic acid prevents this step and thereby uh, it will help in hemostasis. And ethamsalate basically it, uh, it uh, helps in uh, platelet aggregation and it reduces the capillary uh, fragility. So in summary, uh, I would like to uh, say that whenever a patient uh, comes to us uh, who is taking an antiplatelet or anticoagulant drugs, it is important to uh, record a proper uh, history uh, along with the comorbidities that may be present. And in consultation with the patient's uh, physician, uh, considering the risk of bleeding, whether it's a low risk procedure or a high risk procedure, uh, the call can be taken. Uh, in low risk procedures, there is uh, uh, evidence to support that there is no need to stop antiplatelet drugs or even anticoagulant drugs, even for up to INR up till four. Procedures can be performed safely with the use of local hemostatic measures. And uh, we can all keep certain hemostatic agents in the clinic, uh, such as a uh, dental abgel, hemocoagulase, uh, povidone iodine, and uh, bone wax, which can, which can help uh, in situations when, when in complication of this. So I would conclude by saying that a good surgeon doesn't just concentrate on the technical ability, but also on the appropriateness of what you are doing. So we should, we should look at the appropriateness uh, in case of uh, patients taking uh, anticoagulants and antiplatelets if it, is, if it is appropriate to perform the procedure and it does not just depend upon our technical skill to perform the procedure. So thank you. Thank you Please very much. Do you mind going back to your video and stop sharing the slides, please? So we can yes, yes. Yeah, yes. The discussion. Yes. I thank the audience for their patience today because we had uh, quite a few uh, problems with the audio and video, but uh, Dr. Imran has pulled off a brilliant uh, talk today. I'm going to start the panel dis uh, discussion. We've got Dr. Ahad, who's an eminent uh, Max Fax surgeon from the United Kingdom, if I'm not wrong. Um, he'd be part of the panel and I'm going to try and get him run on so that he can um, stop sharing his um, slides and get get on with uh, with this video. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. I'm just just give me one moment. I'm going to unmute the whole um, the moderator Nadine. Sorry. 
I think I'm trying to find out where. Is. Yeah, Doctor Ahad is is having difficulty in logging in with the password. So he just told me a minute. Just send him. Oh, he's coming back in. Yes. Yeah, he's coming back. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, got, got him back in. He's coming back in. <clears throat> Imran, could you turn on your video, please? Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Here's Dr. Ahad in. Yeah, he's connecting. Yeah, that's nice. That's great. That's great. Dr. Ahad? Dr. Ahad, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Could you turn on your video, please, so we can have you on the panel? Assalamu alaikum. Can I, can I start, uh, Dr. Mubarak? Yes, please, carry on. I'll, I'll just you know, keep track of the questions as well. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I welcome you, Dr. Ahad. Uh, Dr. Ahad is a you know consultant of head and neck and oral maxillofacial reconstructive surgery in uh, Bradford Hospitals, and uh, Marshall, an eminent uh, max face surgeon in UK. And uh, and Dr. Imran, uh, great presentation. Kudos to that. Thank Alhamdulillah. You. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll start with the first question. Uh, I think uh, these uh, questions are divided into three subcategories. Uh, mm -hmm. The first question is, uh, what is the role of povidine iodine in hemostasis? <laughs> is this like a quiz? Assalamu alaikum, first thing. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I, I had an MDT up until 11, 11 ish, so that uh, turned out to be a little bit late. But, uh, povidine iodine, I mean, I have not come across it. I don't necessarily use that for that particular reason. I mean, there's, there's a there's a scope for everything in surgery, but there are um, there are other, you know, uh, things one one could use. So povidine iodine, um, that shouldn't be the go-to thing if there's some kind of controversy. I've not I've not come across any evidence to support that. To start with, I think there are ample uh, and enough uh, materials in use, uh, so one would want to go to those rather than trying something straight away. It's like saying. What are, the, what, what are the causes for such and such? You can't just go to a cancer straight away. Some common things are common as the old cliche. So, you know, so I'm not sure about the poverty denied in. I don't know if anybody else can highlight something, but it's not a go-to thing. We don't necessarily use it uh, routinely. Uh, in fact, I've never come across using it. Anybody from my trainers to any colleagues for that matter. So I don't particularly see why one should embark on that. You want to add anything on this, Dr. Imran? Yes, sir. Uh, like basically, povidone iodine, uh, what we do in our uh, college where we work is that uh, in cases of dental extractions, I, sir may be talking about uh, bigger procedures like uh, uh, trauma and stuff. But for minor minor oral surgical procedures where we are doing a simple extraction, uh, the first thing that uh, that we uh, go to when, when there is bleeding is uh, povidone iodine. We, we pack the socket with uh, povidone iodine and... Uh, only when the bleeding does not stop with povidone iodine, we, we go ahead with other measures. But that could also be because of the uh, availability of the materials uh, that, that that we have in the clinical setup and also in colleges. We, don't, we do not have a, a hands-on to all the uh, hemostatic materials. Uh, so that could right. be one reason. And coming to the uh, reason why, uh, like as I said, like as I quoted an article by uh, Dr. Guru Raj Arakeri, they say that it has mainly a, uh, it acts as a chemical cauterization uh, when we use uh, iodine. Uh, mainly the iodine aspect of the povidone iodine is responsible for the hemostatic effect because of the chemical cauterization. And also when we pack uh, uh, the socket with a uh, gauze soaked in uh, povidone iodine we are also aiding in a mechanical hemostasis but as sir said uh, it's uh, i would probably use povidone iodine in cases of minor minor uh, uh, bleeds uh, if at all i feel the bleeding is a little more i would rather directly go to other measures of uh, controlling bleeding I think, Dr. Ahad, when was the last time you operated on minor surgical procedures? Yeah, I should be asking that. <laughs> no, interesting you say that. 
No, I do. I mean, you know, routinely we tend to take teeth out and, uh, and say, for instance, the cancer patient who is going to have or is going to be pretty much prepared to go for uh, adjuvant radiotherapy. So you would like to take those teeth out. And in fact, adjuvants tend to do it. But bleeding effectively, I think, I, I'm sorry I missed your, missed your entire presentation, but I'm sure you've gone through the various aspects of it. I think it's like any other surgery. It doesn't matter what a big or a small surgery. It's planning, which is the most important thing. Uh, history taking, there is no replacement for it. I mean, in medical school, I've been taught 80% of the story or 80% of the history comes from what the patient is telling you. So they're giving it out to you, but you've got to give them a bit of a time. Unfortunately, in this day and age where everyone wants to rush in and make some, uh, you know, because of the number of patients as well, I to forget about the money aspect, um, you don't necessarily get enough. And, uh, but I think extractions cannot be taken very lightly, uh, although it's a piece of cake for most people. But when things go right, it's the piece of cake. When things go wrong, then one has to, you know, be prepared for it. And that's where what makes you or differentiates you from being a good and a, an average uh, dentist or a surgeon. Um, so poverty and iodine is definitely not my go-to thing. I probably won't change my opinion either. <laughs> I'm running to due respect to you. Um, I think there are. It's, there, it. it's a mechanical part of it as you speak. I think compression is an age-old uh, phenomenon. Uh, in times of Pharaoh, 5,000 years ago, perhaps they used the same, and we tend to do the same even till today, and we'll continue to do it. That's a different story. Using providin iodine soaked swab or uh, compression, I'd rather go to adrenaline. I mean, that's got a very, uh, it's, a, it's a known uh, agent, but again, you know, one has to be careful in using what percentage of adrenaline one would use. Simple local anesthetic, which is one in 80,000 to 100,000, is reasonable. You know, if you want to soak it in and shove it into the socket and leave it there for about 5 to 10 to 20, 20 minutes or so, 5 to 20 minutes, so it's a very reasonable right. thing. That's right. That's right. Uh, what's your take on lasers, uh, Dr. Ahad, in hemostasis? Again, I think you guys are going on to uh, things which a common dentist would not have access to. We do uh, have uh, lasers, you know, incorporated in a few uh, setups. So can that be utilized for hemostasis? I think the question is, why does one need to embark on those when they are common things which are very, which are used very efficiently? Uh, I think there are lasers are, it's like a, nowadays, I think it's cure for all or panacea. So for instance, you know, lasers are being used for temporal, temp, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction syndromes uh, with limited successes. So lasers are being used to shrink the area in the oropharynx to avoid or uh, treat, uh, for that matter, uh, snoring. Uh, so all, you know, again, lasers are being used for uh, perhaps hemostasis. But I think they are, again, they're not the go-to sort of thing, especially in oral surgery, where we've got enough on our plate and there's enough evidence to suggest uh, there are other materials which have been used uh, from uh, in a time immemorial, uh, although it's a good idea to practice and try and get a new thing out, but it has to be supported by very reasonable evidence, and there should be a very a reason, absolute reason for us to embark on these bigger, bigger things. You know, right. so again, I don't necessarily use laser uh, personally to um, uh, curb the bleeding. When you have a cautery device, which works perfectly fine, I mean, I don't particularly see where the lasers would come in. Um, if there is a bony bed, you know, you are, you've got other things as well, because there's a socket uh, where you can't see the bleed, and it's usually not an arterial bleed, uh, shouldn't be an arterial bleed, to be honest, if it's one is taking out a two, two uh, because if there is an arterial bleed, something seriously has gone wrong, you need to question yourself for it. You know, anomalies are very, very uncommon, uh, but if that happens, then there are other ways of managing it, like bone wax and, uh, and absolute, uh, you know, you've got to see what you're doing first. Uh, I, mean, I can talk about it if need be, but with lasers, again, <laughs> not, not a go-to thing. Right, 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 great, great, great. Uh, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, uh, the gelatin sponges like Abgel, what Dr. Imran mentioned in one of your slides, uh, Dr. Imran, uh, they are of uh, porcine derivatives. Uh, so any gelatin sponge uh, of another, uh, any other derivatives apart from porcine, because there are few, you know, uh, issues with the uh, uh, 
uh, with your religion, you know. Do you inform your patients before placing the sponges that is it porcine or any other substitute apart from porcine? So uh, Britain benefits from a, a big Muslim population. And NHS is fantastic in the sense we've got all the problems as well, but at the same time, they are fantastic. It's one of the better things which has happened to the country in 1947 and is still holding strong. Now, they have a policy of trying to utilize and use things which are going to be used uh, for pretty much most people across the board. And they consider um, the fact that there is enough patients in the community who come into the National Health Service who, are, who may not like to use pos uh, you know, the, the porcine uh, or bovine, for that matter, uh, uh, substitutes or, uh, or particulate matter, which is of uh, those two things present in any of these uh, agents. Um, so Hemaxil is one of those which I can think of, which, I, which we use, uh, tend to use. Uh, there are certain other things um, I'm going under different tangents now, but uh, for instance, there are dermal substitutes, which are derivatives to start off with um, bovine uh, molecule, but then they take the molecule away eventually before delivering the product out. So then it becomes pretty much an inner thing. So, you know, there are agents like, for instance, vitamin D, you know, common vitamin D you buy off the counter might have for, for uh, porcine elements to it, but then there are others. You, you tell them, the pharmacist, and then they, they, even by looking at the face, they might not want to give you uh, anything which has got porcine uh, elements to it in this country. So there are agents in those uh, gelatin-based substitutes as well. But I think surge itself comes to my mind. You know, it's a very very reasonable thing to have cellulose-based agent, and it tends to do the job again and again and again. And having the right sort of, you know, packing a surge cell, which is what Imran was mentioning about, Dr. Imran was mentioning about as to compression to uh, sort of devices and putting in the right kind of sutures, uh, you know, with the right rule and whatnot, whatever is available in your practice. Uh, so I think, again, my go to thing would be uh, surge cell, uh, which is available for uh, uh, types of surge cell. Or variants of surge cell, the cheaper options are available for surge cell, I believe it's likely more expensive. And I think Hemaxil is perhaps one of those which doesn't have porcine element, but one would want to certainly check it. Thanks a lot. Uh, Dr. Imran, you want to add so, anything uh, to this? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Hemaxil is, is, is it a chitosan product, sir? Like, uh, is it, is it the, what, is what it, product is it? That's what you did. You, you talked about the sponge-based products, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Hemaxil is one of those, which uh, is the sponge-based, whereas uh, mesh-based is your uh, surgical cell. Uh, cell and uh, various. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Imran, since you yes, are a consultant and you go to different clinics, yes, so sir. do you inform your patients, or does the you know in-house dentist inform the patients about the content of the sponge? Or are we liable to inform or are we, you know, uh, should we be informing the patient regarding this? So mainly I think it, it is because of the cost factor that uh, uh, we do not use uh, surgical or uh, other materials because gelatin sponge is uh, relatively cheaply available. Uh, but as such, when it comes to informing the patients, uh, I'm, I'm not really uh, sure if, uh, if, if they've been informed about the uh, material that we are using. Right. But mainly it comes down to the cost because Surgicel is of, uh, around more than 1,000, uh, whereas uh, the gelatin sponge is available for 25 rupees per piece of gelatin sponge. Right. Right. Can I just come in there, Nadine, for a second? Yeah, please. please so ask. It's interesting how the cost implications matter a lot, actually, and it's absolutely true, and it should do. Uh, but there are variants of uh, uh, surge cell from what I know. But again, well, look, you know, 1,000 rupees, I don't know how much that is because there's a bigger, uh, you know, a spread of surge cell as well as the tiny little ones which you get separately, <coughs> uh, packs separately, so 10 to 15 of those in a pack. So, you know, it's interesting the way people in India, um, the things they have to look at, unfortunately, we don't do that. Unless I had a private practice, I probably would. <laughs> I mean, I do a little bit of private work, but again, we don't dwell on these. You know, these are the small things. It is but given for us. But it is absolutely true. And coming back to that question, Nadim, of uh, whether one is responsible, I think they are. We have 
ethical, moral responsibility to our patient as to what goes into their body. The important element is a lot of dentists actually don't look at these products themselves, the, the composition of these products themselves. So one just uses what has been given to them or one, gets, one uses what they have been trained with uh, in most, more, in most, in most sort of, uh, occasions. So I think these are the things which um, such uh, conversations will help us actually dwell on it and pick up, a, you know, the composition leaflet and have a look at it and figure out as to what goes in it and what doesn't. Because it's ultimately it's our responsibility and I think we should be answerable to our patients. Well said, yes, sir. I, I agree with you. Well said, well said, Okrad. Uh, I have a next uh, question. Uh, any of you doctors can take this. Uh, do you have patients lying to you, Dr. Ahad, uh, in, in regard to the medical history when they are you know, on their anticoagulants and they are denying they're not taking anticoagulants? Have you come across any patients? Yeah. I think routinely. I mean, this is interesting. Uh, the thing is, I'm not sure about the lying because I think the white people, there's an interesting thing. Is a lot of uh, people, they have very good... Uh, morals uh, at the same attention. time uh, the, the ones who come into the limelight may not uh, especially when media attention goes to the wrong people i wouldn't necessarily say lying as such but they forget about a lot of things especially the ones who, who are elderly they are on a lot of medications so you come in you talk about the medical history to them so have you got any medical problems answer would be straight away no no doctor i'm, I'm perfectly fine i walk around i do what around i do my activities of daily living then you start to ask them the focused questions. Have you got diabetes? Have you had heart failure? Have you had any heart problems? Do you take any medication? Everything just keeps coming out. Do you take any medication? Oh yeah, something called aspirin. Maybe, yeah, you know. Then a drug list comes out. Uh, then you have to, you know, then you go through it and you figure out that uh, you know, they should have been dead a few, few years ago. And then, you know, you wouldn't be surprised to why they're walking around in this day and age. But yeah, absolutely. I don't necessarily think, I wouldn't go down to the lying part because I think patients in this country, I can only speak for this country, unfortunately, because of my exposure to work in India was very limited when I was there. I left a little bit too early. Um, so I, 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 there will be occasions where people want to get something done desperately. But again, those are the younger ones. Um, as people mature, I think in this part of the uh, world, I think there is less and less of lies, but perhaps more forgetfulness. I'm not sure Dr. Imran's experiences might be a bit different, and your experience that you might be. A bit different. I, I think coming back to the same question, Dr. Rahat, uh, say as you said, you know, people might forget, but uh, if if you're doing a major surgery or minor surgery, when you experience post-op bleeding, so yeah. is it the time that you guys panic? That why is it bleeding? Um, so, no, I mean, that's, that's where the important thing is to plan. But there's always going to be one or two cases who skip and uh, skip through the sea. But most importantly, I think, <coughs> I think it's extremely important. And if it is a major case, they, the patient gets seen multiple times. The patient gets seen by the junior doctor, the foundation doctor. They take a fantastic history. In fact, they're the ones who take the best of the histories because they have, they're just fresh from the medical dental schools. <laughs> As you keep growing up in, the, in your career, you have less and less time to uh, invest in the medical history, but it is very important. But, you know, as you keep growing in your specialty, you get more focused rather than talking about, oh, well, how many wives you have and what do you do, uh, you know, what do you eat, what do you do, what's your dental? So they are focused. You know, you, you could take the same history in five minutes and get by. Um, and so importantly, I think, uh, um, Nadeem, um, just going back to your point, which is uh, to do with history, it is all to do with planning for a surgery, really. So once you've planned in, and there's always going to be some, some, some people who, who skip and you know, just come through the same. Um, so those are the patients, especially I've seen amongst the patients who take steroids. Their skins are very friable. We do doing a sort of skin procedure, or for that matter, even mucosal. Uh, they tend to bleed more than usual. That's when you start to think: Was there anything in your history which I miss? I mean, it's happened to me a few times. Steroid has caught me a few times. Uh, then you start to think: Oh well, we didn't tell me a bit before. Um, but you are where you are, so you, you you've got to make do with what you've got. And uh, this is where I think your your experiences come in. I mean, 
Alhamdulillah, I have to admit, I've seen some bleeds in the neck, um, skull base as well. Uh, panic um, is probably not the right word now. I think uh, <laughs> you can't panic. I think if you panic, your entire team is going to panic. So uh, there are ways to deal with it. Yes, the first thing you do is put pressure. Whatever happens, gush of blood, pressure. Because the other side will take care of it, even if it's a big carotid vessel. Uh, you know. Um, so you're not going that far, I think Max Rafesh said. If someone is doing orthognathic surgery, one or two might be in, in, your, uh, in your teams as well. Uh, there's blood at the top where, you know, uh, skull base, that's where you do your pterygoid disjunctions. Uh, greater auricular arteries can bleed and beyond that, uh, pterygoid venous plexuses can bleed. First thing you do is pressure right. and then call for <clears throat> All right. Dr. Imran, are you online? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'll just come back to the same question what uh, Dr. Ahad was telling. Yes, uh, see, uh, the practices are quite different uh, in different countries, in yes, particularly sir. in India. Uh, yes, see, what I have seen personally is, you know, patients, uh, uh, Dr. Ahad said, you know, patients there, he had put it in a very subtle way, like patients forget. But here, you know, patients fake it. Uh, in fact, they, they deny taking anticoagulants because, you know, the dentist would not perform the, that particular uh, dental surgery or extractions, right? You agree on this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So the, the reason is uh, the moment they give the history of anticoagulants, we have the tendency of, you know, writing a referral letter to the concerned yes. physician to, you know, get a consent form back. And where people are not ready to go to their concerned physicians. So, in case you have a case like this, and and you land up a case where it is bleeding, and you come to know that patient was on a high dose of anticoagulants, how do you manage those cases in your practice? Yeah, sir. Uh, like mainly, like uh, as sir said, like first of all, recording a case history is is uh, the most important thing when it comes to when it comes to doing any form of treatment. For example, I would like to uh, give uh, one scenario which I came across. Normally, like we see the patient secondarily after uh, the uh, resident doctor has seen. So this was a young patient. Uh, uh, so the resident doctor assumed that the patient is not having any uh, medical complications. So once I I reported to the clinic for the procedure on on uh, questioning the patient, uh, he had a history of deep vein thrombosis and he was he was taking. Uh, uh, anticoagulants uh, for the same. So uh, before starting any procedure, it, it is very important. And a lot of times, like for example, in patients with deep vein thrombosis, uh, they do not feel it is necessary to inform a dentist uh, uh, regarding uh, the medication that they are taking for something like a deep vein thrombosis, and it may be related to your dental procedure. So it, it is very important to pester them and question them regarding any other comorbidities that they may be having, any other medications, any medications as such that they may be taking. So that is the first thing that uh, you know, we have to take a proper history and try to be sure that the patient is not on any uh, medications as such. But as you said, sometimes there are cases where uh, we have we have performed a procedure and patient has come back after uh, 24 hours or two days with a, with something called as a, a liver clot uh, where uh, you see like a big uh, hematoma is seen in the oral cavity. So in such cases, we have to opt for the, if, if we uh, encounter it intraoperatively, uh, we have to use uh, local hemostatic measures. As uh, I said during the presentation also that uh, with local hemostatic measures, it can be managed. And as sir rightly said, uh, sir rightly said that the use of uh, laser or electrocautery uh, is very uh, rare uh, in, in this type of cases. It can be very well uh, managed with just uh, local hemostatic measures. So I think uh, that is the first uh, go-to uh, when we encounter bleeding uh, to use to use a hemostatic agent. First, first we apply pressure uh, and see if the bleeding stops. If the bleeding is not stopping, then uh, opt for a local hemostatic measure and then secure it with a good suture. Fine, thank you. We have a we have one more question, something related to this. Okay, the doctor I, asks. Sorry, yeah, sorry, yes, doctor. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think it's important. This um, that patients are not telling you the truth for a reason. Patients are not born liars, so the, I think they're trying to escape this the the labyrinthine process, the system here. So I think the important message, really, for for, for you guys, I think, who are working in uh, in India and other parts of the world where this happens more commonly, is to try and make their life simple. So uh, warfarin, for instance, uh, it can be you know your INR can be tested within no time, having a small device, 
is you do a little skin prick test, take a little drop of blood like you would check the glucose and you have it. And I and I is not a huge issue these days because uh, I don't know what you guys have, you probably follow the similar sort of rules, but I and I up to four, one would do simple extractions without too many concerns. If it's multiple extractions, I think that's when issues come in. So I think the important message is you probably want to develop a sort of a protocol where you're trying to get the truth out of the patient and trying to make them understand, well, look, this is for your own health. You bleed, you die. Nothing to do with me. You are the ones who's going to, who's going to suffer. And in turn, we might suffer, at this, 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 you know, a bit of remorse, but that's you who's going to suffer. But for that matter, I think trying to make their life a bit simpler, you can have this device very easily. How, what percentage of your footfall, the patients who come in to see you guys, uh, are on anticoagulants? They will be on antiplatelet drugs. That's a different story altogether. So it's, it's, it's perhaps, what, 2%, 2 out of 100 maybe? Um, you know, so these things can be managed by making their life a little bit more simple. And no, no, uh, NOACs, which is your newer oral, oral anticoagulants, which I'm sure Dr. Mann must have uh, alluded to, spoken about, rivaroxabans and dabigatrins and epixabans, you know, you give about 24 to 48 hours, okay? But they are very, they are short acting. So even once bleeds, unless they take the next day's dose, they don't bleed beyond 24 hours in an ideal world, all right? But ideally, you want to stop that 24 hours earlier. And the other thing really is about having somebody being on aspirin and clopidogrel. I mean, the routine uh, sort of guidance would be to go ahead and take tooth out. If someone is on a dual platelet therapy, which is for a reason, because they would have had their heart attacks about a year ago, which is laxative, which effectively means you might want to stop one. And these are the patients I appreciate. You might want to take some guidance of the cardiologist. Uh, but warfarin, I think, is a common thing in this country. I mean, I talk about 2%, but I think it might be a bit more in this country uh, because they live much longer, I suspect, um, in this part of the world. Uh, but we've got enough things to think, do within the practice. And I think one should develop those uh, to make their life a bit simpler. That's what I was trying to cut you. I think you have just given me a sense of relief when you have given a window of INR up to five. Oh. We guys... Four. Yeah. We guys panic. We have INR up to even 2.53. We just panic, you know, and we just send them out. So, so, sorry, you send them home without doing anything? Yeah, yeah. We tell them to, you know, get the consent back and, you know, get in touch with a consent cardiologist. I think it's a different practice now. I think, I don't know whether it is to do with, there's a lot of things like here. Uh, education, a lot of you guys uh, are excel, I think, because education in India is fantastic, but the practical aspects of it is where we lack. We don't get to see, we don't get to do very much before we get out of the dental school. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think it's a very similar case here in this country as well. But what they have here, which is a bit different, is vocational training, which is a year of internship, which is what we've done in India. I've studied dentistry with you, Nadine, in India. Um, so, um, you know, that's a little bit different. Here, that vocational training gives them all that they need to go out there and do things out in the open. Um, um, so INR of four is perfectly fine. It has been researched, evidence. So what they're saying is you are likely to bleed four times. That's how I look at it. I'm a surgeon. Keep it simple. You know, keep it simple. What is what does an INR of two mean? Well, you might you're likely to bleed twice. How much of a bleed can happen after an extraction? Well, a few mils. Add that uh, times two or times three times four. And that's you. But if you are embarking on surgical extraction, although we tend to do surgical extraction you know, with an INR of four, I would be tempted to, you know, be a bit more wary of it, especially in a dental practice where you have no access to a lot of things. You know, perhaps, you know, make it a protocol of three. Three should be reasonable. Go ahead and do it. And that's great. That's be, prepared. Great. be prepared to do what you need to do just by extracting the tooth. As someone who has had, uh, who is on warfarin or any anticoagulants or noax for that matter, play safe, take the tooth out, pack it, shove it all what you need to, surgery cells, hemax cells, or the, whatever gelatin based substitutes you have, and then put the right kind of sutures like Dr. Imran has mentioned, you know, that's you. And if you have come across more and more that your patients are lying Unfortunately, you might have to embark on uh, this particular thing for every patient. Pack it up, 
you know, put up one or two sutures or just pack it up at least, forget the sutures, and then charge them for that <laughs> if you have to. <laughs> uh, Dr. Imran, <clears throat> the same question, you know, I have a, a, a second question coming up with the same question related. How do you control rebound hemorrhages here? Yeah? Uh, sorry, the, Dr. Ahad, uh, just a moment, please. Um, I think uh, the question first, which, which you've just answered, was asked by Abid. Um, and he's re he's re he's uh, wants a continuation of this, and he's re he's requested. He just suggested that the bleeding is systemically generated. Local hemostatic measures will it work? So, if you don't mind, uh, either of you can take the question. I suspect he means when someone is on anticoagulants. Is that what he means? Yeah. Yes. I think I, it's not yeah. anticoagulants. It's a systemically generated. Systemically generated. It's <coughs> not present locally. Systemically generated, but present locally. You were talking about following a dental extraction. The bleed is coming only from the extraction socket. It's not coming from anywhere else. So you will take local measures. If it is unsustainable, then of course you would go on to the other measures. The local measures we've talked about, I'm sure Dr. Imran has highlighted it. Um, I'm sure about the, the, you know, the compressions, then suturing, packing it up, uh, perhaps use of adrenaline, um, soap swabs, uh, and so on and so forth. Then, then comes the various other things. Now, one, the tranexamic acid is actually underrated. Um, I'm pretty sure Dr. Imran must have alluded to it as well in his speech. Um, tranexamic acid can be used uh, as mouthwash. So 500 micrograms of it, freely available, which is about 5%, uh, you ask them to swish it in the mouth and don't swallow it. Spit it out four times in a day. Does the job very well. Of course, ask them to give it a bit of a time before they start because uh, you know, the first part of your coagulation cascade is vasoconstriction. And that's the reason we advise them not to spit, not to suck on the wound, so on and so forth, before the pathways, intrinsic and extrinsic pathways even uh, kick in. Uh, the first thing is first platelet aggregation and, you know, uh, your vasoconstriction uh, happens. So uh, to answer uh, Abid's question, um, I think it's important that it is coming from local areas. So deal with it like uh, you would. Uh, don't worry about this war friend business. Okay. And that's my opinion, really. Um, uh, and I'm pretty sure that opinion goes across the board, across this country. I suspect in the West as well, because a lot of people are on, on these uh, medications. If these don't work, and reactionary bleeding, I think, as in the must, you know, that can happen as a result of these anticoagulants and secondary bleeding. But secondary bleeding is pretty much an infection unless proven otherwise. Uh, but reactionary bleeding can happen when they're sucked on the wound two to three, four, four hours, six hours later. Uh, if this happens, then you ask them to call you up. And I tell them uh, specifically if your mouth is full of blood, let us know. If you're oozing blood, we're not interested, you know, um, because a lot of people go on to do blood tests, so on and so forth. You don't need to, you know, what, what is the reason for us? How much you can lose, you can exsanguinate for perhaps from a dental socket, but how many have you seen? How many has the world seen? You know, unless they are uh, hidden hemophiliacs and born uh, with the brands, you know, it's very, 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 very rare. Okay, that'll be a case report. Yeah, great, great. Uh, Dr. Mubarak, can I continue? Dr. Yes, Mubarak? Yeah, yeah, please yeah. do. Please do. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm just taking questions randomly, keeping the conversation in chain. So it might be, you know, from top to bottom, anywhere, random pick. So just coming to the same question, <clears throat> how do you control rebound hemorrhages, uh, Dr. Imran? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me, Dr. Imran? Yes, sir. So yeah. like... Uh, for example, we have uh, we, we use adrenaline as a uh, as a local hemostatic uh, measure. There there is a, a small risk that there may be a rebound uh, uh, once uh, the vasoconstriction is done. There may be a little rebound vasodilation and bleeding. Mainly like uh, again, it, it's all the same thing. The management protocols remain the same. Uh, you will consider the bleeding uh, uh, like if the patient if the patient is having bleeding for more than eight to twelve hours or if the patient reports back to the dental clinic within this period of time, or he develops a hematoma or a, or a, or a liver clot. So generally, if there is a rebound vasodilation, the patient will have uh, some constant bleeding that will be present. If it, if it is persisting beyond eight to 12 hours, 
is when we need to again uh, uh, intervene with the local hemostatic measures and as sir said like if at all there is uh, if you feel that there is any risk of uh, bleeding uh, in patients that you are treating it's always better to prophylactically uh, place a hemostatic local hemostatic agent and secure it with sutures yeah great uh, you want to add anything dr ahad okay yeah. shall i continue with the next question no i think it's spot on There's nothing to add there uh, dr ran spot on yeah fine uh, i think that this question is one, yeah. one other thing just to, just to be sure i think the, you know as a trainee as a trainee there's two things the consultant used to come in and do and you 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 used to think you'd think oh, how stupid could i have been uh, they would move the light and focus the light into the right area and they would make the hole bigger access access and light such an important thing so i think if someone has reactionary bleed they go to thing as dr imran said i don't refute anything i think it's spot on uh, the only thing really is if they have, if you've packed in something there don't feel obliged to leave that thing there take it out take everything out have a proper look have things changed here you know take everything out then you know make sure you suction it all out have a proper look there is no uh, alternative to having a proper look and uh, having a good access and the light effectively it sounds like a very trivial thing but i'm telling you i've been there and you start to think well that was that then wasn't it um so take it out suction it all out and have a proper look in the socket as best as you can with a mouth mirror whatever you have you know, right thing to do really and pack it up again i have a next question quite uh, an interesting one by dr asim uh be it any surgery do you advise the patients to stop foods like fish or cranberry juice post extraction or post surgery uh, they, if they are on anticoagulants is there any you know uh, literature supporting that well look i think um, having known a little bit of india i mean i've taken my dad a few times to the hospital in the recent past i think we take a few things to the, to a different level you know this parhez Uh, which is of course an old word which most people understand i think it doesn't it doesn't there, there isn't one in in the western world even for that matter spinach or things like that perhaps that might play a little bit of a role in having re, you know developing renal stones or people who have renal stones i think you just go and do what you need to do within reason um so i do not have any view on these cranberries or for that matter anything else now again don't look at the literature which is published anywhere and everywhere china produces millions of publications each year china pays india also does it i believe to the journals they have journals who are uh, you know um, the local journals who who desperately need some work so that they can have their uh, impact factor of some distinction so look at the broader picture i mean cochrane again to some extent i know where they live they live in manchester um they're not bad okay cochrane is usually the reviews so they come to pick up all the all the papers from various uh, free various areas and then club them together it's so effectively meta analysis and so on so forth so, so look at the bigger pictures and better papers in better journals which have a reasonable impact uh, factors um so that's that's my opinion about it i mean i have not come across uh, cranberry in particular or for that matter any food you just go ahead and do it uh, yes medications yes you know metronidazole for example which is the commonest of the drugs which you tend to use flagellum you don't necessarily prescribe them with mucumarins anticoagulants you know uh coming to the same section you know what about social drinkers yeah i think your country has highest number of social drinkers uh, you do you take any kind of precautions because the lft is quite altered in these kind of patients yeah but look lfts are altered if you do the lfts if a patient comes in and tells you he drinks now this is where people can lie i agree now this is one place where people lie in this country so the average uh, which the health authorities in this country um give out is i think it used to be 21 units a week for men and 14 for women I recall I used to remember 7214 and 7321 but nowadays it's 14 units so now how many of us actually know what the beer content, content is what is uh, whiskey's content and uh, what is something else I mean I'm fasting I don't want to embark on this journey yet but you know these are these are practical things which you 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 come across 
Um, so 14 units is a normal. They will almost always lie. I mean, looking at through the recent uh, undoing of the lockdown, the massive queues were to do what? To pick up alcohol in India. So there are tons of people who drink, uh, who may or may not lie, who, who may tell you. You just go ahead and do the extraction. You don't do a liver function test just because he, think, he tells you that he drinks. Because social drinkers or drunkards in this country are ample numbers. Do, does the dentist go on and do it? Unless they tell you that they have a liver problem, they have a liver cirrhosis that can lead to this. So that's the question you ask. I mean, my go-to question is, are you being investigated for liver problems? Have you had a biopsy of liver? So those two questions give it away for me. Uh, again, I can't speak to people who lie, <laughs> but you know, that's not what the patients are meant to do anyway. Right, right, right. Uh, Dr. Imran, uh, your take on anti-epileptic patients, yeah? Uh, any uh, investigations you do in anti-epileptics because even, I suppose even they have compromised LFT is something uh, you want to uh, talk on it? Generally, generally no, sir. Like uh, any patients that we come across for regular treatment, the, any patient that is, uh, that is taking any anti-epileptic drug, as such, we do not ask for any uh, additional investigation unless unless there, there is any hint indicating towards that, as, uh, as Sir said, if there is any uh, hint indicating towards a liver dysfunction, only then probably advice and investigation, otherwise probably not necessary. Right. And, uh, and same question, I would like you to answer this. If you, for Indian scenario, if you want to, you know, have one, I'm say one hemostatic agent in the clinic, which is that you want to keep it? Probably uh, a couple, sir. One uh, is, uh, like again, uh, there is a question about uh, usage of gelatin sponge. So, Surgicel is one option that that we can we can keep. Uh, we can keep hemocoagulase. We can keep bone wax. Uh, this uh, two three things. Uh, if we have even uh, like hemocon dressing, uh, if it's possible. Otherwise, yeah, any local hemostatic agent such as a Surgicel, bone wax to control any bone bleed, and probably a hemocoagulase can be uh, kept in the clinic. Okay, can the bone wax be handled in a very simple way, even by a general dentist, or you know, you yes. require some kind of quantity no, or that Basically, particular thing like that? Uh, bone wax it, 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 it itself does not have any hemostatic property. It is it is basically like a like a piece of wax which you just need to warm it a bit so that you can knead it. Like if you if you have used an M seal which we used to block uh, the water leakages. It is something similar. You are just blocking the marrow spaces to prevent the bleeding. It does not, as such, have any hemostatic uh, property uh, by itself. But the problem with the use of bone wax is that it has it has a, uh, a foreign body type of a reaction sometimes, and it can lead to a foreign body granuloma formation. The alternative that we have available uh, to bone wax, which is which is more biocompatible, is is something called as austin. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the availability of, of it in this part of the world. Uh, like, sir can, uh, sir can tell about it if they use any. I might want to just add one or two lines about bone wax. The bone wax, I think that we, we pointed out, does, can an average dentist use the bone wax? I think they can. And the reason for that is we've been trained to use the wax uh, when we started doing these uh, wax models. Uh, you just play, you know, the, the, or the orthodontic wax. You know, the, the bone wax, what we're talking about, is a wax which can easily be molded in your hands. You don't need to warm it up anywhere else, but within your fingers. Your body temperatures will, temperature will do the trick. Now, you use a very limited amount. Uh, as uh, Dr. Imran rightly pointed out, there is, this is a foreign body. It's maybe an agent which stops because of uh, it's a compression or, you know, sealing off the micro uh, vasculatures. So you use it as a very slim smear. And instruments such as, I don't know, uh, I'm trying to think what was in it, periosteal elevator, the back end of it, the fine end of it, you know, or the tip end of it, which can easily, you could use it. And uh, uh, once you've shoved a little bit into the socket and roll it across as if you're plastering the socket with a very small smear. And that's what it's doing. Okay, and if it's bleeding again, just use it again. Now it, it can, tends to come off. It tends to come off. So once or twice, once you've done it, it it, it usually stays in, does the job. Right, right. 
thank you uh, the next question is i think uh, this is this is in and out uh, we see in our daily practices you know when you have a patient on anticoagulants um, uh, for example echo sprint of 150 mg or 300 mg and we refer them back to the concerned physician so the concerned physician he does is you know they stop the usual dosage and they start with uh, you know uh, a minimum dosage of 75 mg and they tell us to you know proceed with the dental procedure so but even then it, we are quite uh, you know uh, uh, apprehensive to still carry on because the patient is on echo sprint so you want to add anything on this so it does that does that matter to us you know from 300 to 75 post op bleeding is that for me anyone i think you can answer or dr imran anybody can answer this so my perspective answer is no i think you're wasting time you're wasting time sending the patients back and forth this is why the patients are lying to you if we if for instance now you have bangalore dental association or is it karnataka dental association why don't you come out with a protocol write to the hematologist as a group of individuals then individual dentists and come out with a protocol aspirin plays no role you cannot stop aspirin the aspirin is an anti platelet drug and it works on the entire life of the platelet and the the lives of the baby is about 7 to 10 days so are you going to stop aspirin in a person who is likely to have a stroke so their risk profile i they've had a previous mi myocardial infarction so you're not that's like playing with the fire a dental extraction will not kill them but an mi can cause cardiac arrest and kill them instantly instantly so one has to be really careful i don't agree with stopping aspirin whatsoever unless they're on a dual platelet therapy topidogrel and aspirin i think there's a room one could talk about it one could perhaps stop one or the other but not both because uh, there's uh, you know too many things so i think easiest bet if there is so much confusion around it because in this part of the world there is no confusion whatsoever because there are protocols you can simply follow the protocols which are there perhaps in the nice guidelines or i think there's hematology guidelines which is called the dch or something bs the british society of uh, something hematology they will have the guidelines as well but to make it a uh, uh, full proof get the approval of the hematological society locally and then distribute that across the practices everywhere then you have it laminated uh, talking about noax Uh, anticoagulants, uh, coumarin sort of thing, warfarin, what's the other one? I forget. Uh, Synthrome, uh, that sort of medications, and uh, uh, platelet, uh, antiplatelets. That we get um, antiplatelets. You know, do your aspirins and topidogrels. Uh, there's one of dipyridamol and one or two others. You know. Uh, so uh, uh, get it written in stone. Get it stamped. Is my uh, my opinion. And but answer to your question is no. Antiplatelets, no. Get on with it. Thank you. Dr. Imran, I have a question for you. Uh, see, uh, what if the bleed is from the gingival crevices where there is no open socket, and you cannot suture it or you cannot pack it? So, how do you uh, manage those kinds of bleeding? Yeah. So generally, if it is, if it is from a gingival crevice, I think I think we can we can place a suture. Uh, it is it is it is possible to place a suture when it is bleeding from from a soft tissue. We can uh, somehow manage to get a stitch there, but. uh in, in case in case if you are not able to uh, suture uh, if it's just a small gingival cravicular bleed it may stop by itself if it's a capillary bleed otherwise you can use some styptic agent such as a monsal solution which can be applied with the help of a cotton applicator but i i do not think that such situation may arise and i think a small bleed from the gingival crevice may, can be managed by suturing right and uh, dr imran your take on liver clot and its management liver clot it's it basically can be uh, managed by nice curettage uh, what you need to do is when you when you see the patient with a liver liver clot it may be because the patient may be on anticoagulant therapy or maybe some liver dysfunction uh, so first thing we have to rule out the reasons for uh, liver clot but the management is is simple uh, you just need to uh, remove the clot curette the socket nicely if any granulation tissue is there that may itself be the reason so to nicely cure it out the granulation tissue and irrigate it with betadine and then we can pack it uh, with some local hemostatic agent and a good suture should be right uh, i think i have one or two questions more uh, dr ahad i would like you to take this question if the local measures fail to stop bleeding what are the other measures can be intervened at that particular time absolutely i think this is relevant 
question again uh, the local measures you've tried and then the you, next uh, you embark onto the systemic measures injectables uh, or for that matter yeah you know and what are these measures i mean these are beyond the scope of uh, dental practice and one has to get onto the phone to the right kind of specialist um, so when do you do this uh, you know you would have tried some local measures to start with and if that doesn't work um, now, various anticoagulants have some antidotes, and a lot of them don't, okay? Um, so the, I think uh, once you are in a secondary care setup, they would start off by investigating it. Uh, of course, the history comes into being again, uh, whether they are known uh, bleeding disorder patients uh, or liver dysfunction patients, you know, von Willebrand's and hemophilia, comes to my mind. Um, if that's the case, you would want to do their blood tests and, and, and make sure. Uh, and then, of course, you do the group and say, uh, or cross-match, depending on what, uh, how, how bad the bleeding is. Now, there's a difference between group and save and cross-match. I probably won't want to go into that if uh, that may not be useful if it's, uh, unless you want it. Uh, but um, importantly, I think investigation, so history taking, investigation. So first referral, then investigation, history, uh, history taking, investigation. And then you work on the clotting screens, investigation-wise, uh, your uh, hemoglobin, and perhaps a group and save. And moving on from there, depending, depending on what they are taking, if you realize that they are an anticoagulant, uh, fresh frozen plasma seems to have been doing the trick for, uh, uh, you know, for many years now, because uh, it has platelet factors in it. Uh, people do infuse platelets into it for coagulation to develop the coagulation cascade. Um, and uh, the other thing would be to specific antidotes have also been used. For instance, warfarin has a specific antidote called protamine sulfate, but it takes a little while before it uh, develops the chelating complexes, I think, if I recall correctly. But I think fresh frozen plasma is being used. Now, one has to be careful with platelets. Platelet infusion is to try and develop uh, the, or the, the clotting cascade, but especially in people who have valvular dysfunction and hence a mechanical valve, infusing platelet in, platelets into them can cause uh, um, effectively like uh, endocarditis, which is secondary to these platelets, which can become pretty sticky and go and stick into those valves, mechanical valves. So one has to be really careful about. So I think if they are excessively bleeding, this patient is a hospital candidate and let the hospital deal with it. It's not your headache now. Uh, but I think it's a good idea to know about these. Uh, for instance, if there's uh, von Willebrand's or hemophilia, you tend to use things like desmopressin, I think, which are, which, which you know, they are injectables again. The other, I, I'll come back to this again. I've, I've alluded, to the, uh, alluded to this medication in, uh, a minute ago, I think, is tranexamic acid. Intravenous tranexamic acid, one gram IV, is a good drug. It is very commonly, I think it started off in, uh, in women uh, uh, who have postpartal bleeding or for that matter, menorrhagia and so on and so forth. They can be given as oral medications as well, 500 micrograms BD. Um, safely, pretty much, or if they're in a hospital setup, they get an intravenous tranexamic acid. And once that's done, but you, there is no alternative to managing this locally. Good sutures, uh, good compression of the socket, uh, and then, of course, dealing with your uh, systemic measures. And, um, Adding the same question to Dr. Imran, uh, how much time would yeah, Dr. Ahad, sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, absolutely, go for it. You might want yeah. to add uh, Yeah, Dr. Imran, uh, how much time you would like to wait chair side, you know, if it is not stopping locally? What is your take on this? Sir, it, uh, it probably will, will depend upon uh, the kind of bleed uh, uh, that, that I'm having, whether it's, it's, it's a slow bleed, if it's, if it's just oozing. And if, uh, if it is just a slow oozing, continuous oozing from the socket, I would just like to uh, pack it with a uh, gelatin sponge and suture it and just wait for the bleeding to stop. Uh, normally, uh, in cases, uh, if, if the patient is on uh, antiplatelets or anticoagulants, un un unless the INR is, is uh, close to 4 or above 4, 
below that we can manage it by hemostatic measures but if the patient is bleeding excessively even uh, after using the local hemostatic measures as as i said that uh, during my presentation also that we have certain antidotes uh, such as protamin sulfate and uh, for porphyrin we have uh, fresh frozen plasma that can be used so uh, when when you, when you feel it's beyond your control when it will further not be managed uh, by local hemostatic uh, measures it's, it's then when we, we would probably plan to shift the patient uh, to the hospital but uh, i think like uh, <coughs> in in most of the cases with an inr which is below 4 we can manage it by uh, local hemostatic measures okay uh, so what i understand is so imagine i have a patient a case scenario i have a patient with no medical history given and i proceed with a simple tooth extraction and the bleeding doesn't stop and i try to you know manage locally and even that is not happening so that is where i dial the hospital nearest hospital and i tell them you know ship this patient to the nearest hospital yes sir if the mouth is constantly filling up with blood there is constant pooling of blood that is that is happening that is not stopping by local hemostatic measures that is when probably we would shift the patient to the hospital not when there is a slow slow oozing from the socket uh, we have to be a little patient when we are when we are dealing with the uh, bleeding it will not immediately stop in a few seconds or a couple of minutes uh, so we have to take a little time first probably pack it uh, wait for a, a few minutes and then probably if still it is not stopping we can use some local, local hemostatic measures and uh, nicely suture it it's only when we have used the local uh, measures and when it is not stopping uh we can think about uh, like uh, hospitalization of the patient and also the kind of bleed that that you are having it it, it uh, normally in an extraction in a simple extraction you will you will not encounter an uh, arterial bleed as such uh, unless and until you, you probably very m- minor small chance of damaging a greater palatine artery if you if you fracture the palatal bone when trying to remove the palatal root of the upper first or the second molar so those are the condition if it's an arterial bleed spurting out uh, probably uh, you know it cannot be probably managed in a uh, clinical uh, setup if, if, if it's uh, right i think bottom line i understand is be uh, you know be patient and be calm when bleeding happens yes sir uh, we have it takes a little bit of time to stop if i may add one or two things i think um just on that subject i, I was nearly going to pitch in before you uh, said what you said absolutely correct i mean there are i'm sure within the panel members as well as uh, the audience who's here listening to us they might have come across one or two patients following an extraction the bleeding doesn't stop and then eventually they get diagnosed with hemophilia or olmid brands okay so there are many instances following a dental extraction especially in the younger lot who not had too many they might have had a scratch or a cut or a bleed here and there but they wouldn't have taken notice of it uh, so these are the ones uh, you need to send them across you need to speak to them i think what is also very 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 important is how you communicate to the person on the phone if you there's no room for panicking unfortunately but that comes with time um you got to see a few of these uh feel the blood in your finger within your fingers to be able to stop panicking because the blood for there's a reason it's red because that's really a sign of danger isn't it so it's normal uh, to panic have a bit of knowledge around yourself be able to speak you know you can always say well you know i've come across one or two patients in my practice or my seniors practice who have been down on the hemophilia so are following this you know this particular thing doesn't seem to stop i have done what i have done so you need to chalk that out i've done i've taken local measures of such and such and such and such so what you're telling them is you're not just uh, you know, shifting the blame to somebody else you are mutually responsible for the patient you're taking responsibility and you have done within the remits of what you could do within a dental practice and then you are embarking on something else okay and the other things are uh, systemic involvement in in the sense blood pressure tends to go down so one or two things you could clearly do you've got a small blood pressure gadget so you can monitor locally get blood pressure heart rate and blood pressure usually you see nothing because you shouldn't unless the heart rate can go a little bit up because of anxiety more than anything else but again i don't want to go into the types of um, hemorrhage because there's 1 2 3 4 uh, but anyway so i think it's i get to communicate very well that's the key you mean the heart rate and the bp of the doctor or the patient well it depends <laughs> where you are in your career <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can try okay, both uh, 
Um, and I, yeah. I don't think there's a time for it, but I recall one of our seniors, Nadeem, uh, if, you, if you remember him, he was, uh, I think, taking the first pediatric tooth out. He managed to get a patient of the slum, and he kept saying to him in, uh, in Canada uh, that you know, nothing's going to happen. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. This is just a small needle. They took the needle out, and he fainted. The patient was absolutely fine. You recall that? Either? Yeah, yeah. Those, those are good days, yeah. Seriously, yeah. good days. Okay, uh, I have a uh, last question for the day. Uh, uh, Dr. Imran, how, how do you classify the risks with warfarin, yeah? Hello? Yeah, Dr. Imran. Yes, sir. Can, uh, how can do you I, classify I... the risks with warfarin? Sir, with warfarin, uh, basically, as I, as I said uh, during the presentation also, the procedures that are the low-risk procedures, which, which include simple extractions and simple uh, with, with a restricted wound size and... Uh, say uh, those procedures can be performed with INR even up to four. Some articles say up to three, but uh, there is a lot of literature which suggests that with uh, 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 with warfarin, even if the INR is up to four, simple procedures can be performed. It's only when you are doing complex surgical procedures such as an impaction, an episectomy, or or be it a periodontal surgery, when you are doing complex surgical procedures is is when you need to seek consultation with the physician as to any alteration is required, whether any bridging bridging therapy to heparin or low molecular weight heparin uh, is required for the procedure or any alteration is required. Otherwise, for simple procedures, uh, even uh, up till uh, four, the INR, the simple extractions can be performed, but with the local hemostatic measures uh, have to be used for the procedures. Yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, what I analyze, uh, Dr. Ahad, I think the the treatment protocol in every country varies, I guess. And I think uh, we are on a little step behind in following good guidelines in proper management and, you know, the safety measures of the patients. That is what I understand. The guidelines given in your country is far different, or probably it should be the same what we should be following, but you follow it strictly because taking... Uh, uh, your, you know, those uh, uh, court issues, basically, you know, you're getting uh, sued by the patients, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I I implying bad technique or, you know, not following proper, proper protocol. Unlike India, we don't have a definite protocol. See, we, we entirely rely on ourselves or the concerned physician who's treating the patient. And, you know, there's only two of us coordinating. We don't have you know, a third person, you know, telling us. So it's like we just abide what the clinician says you sure. stop this and you proceed with the, your dental procedure. And we just blindly follow that. So unless and until uh, you just highlighted, you know, uh, there's no necessary measures of st stopping even 75 or 150 or 300 because the patient might have the risk of developing an Azakin MI attack. That's right. so, uh, so I think this is where we lack. And benefits really. Yeah. So what are this and what are the benefits out of any procedure stopping any medication? Um, this is where I think Nadeem I alluded to earlier, developing a protocol is extremely important. Yeah. I think you guys can do it. Um, you have a number of people. Now, mashallah, how many people are listening to this or for that matter are on the group? I think there's about more than 200 if I recall. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I might be totally guessing here, but I think there are about 200. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So we, 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 across various boards. Um, and protocols are not difficult. Your prime minister, picks up the protocol from this country for the package which he's trying to deliver, right? So the lockdown measures have been picked up from somebody else, okay? That's what countries do. We follow the other countries, whatever is good there, whatever is good here. So what we are following here uh, is, I think your, your, your prime minister is following there anyway. So similarly, there are nice guidelines here. The guidelines on various websites, American, I don't know, society, dental society, ABA, I think it's called, isn't it? They will be. Why didn't one of you guys go with these protocols to some hematology, they must be a hematology society of, uh, I don't know, Bangalore, um, and then get it ratified by them. Cardiology society, you know? The problem really is, I don't know whether it's about, if you refer a patient to somebody, they're not going to write a letter to you without uh, you know, uh, uh, invoicing the patient as such, do they? If that's the case, there is that element where they want to hear from you so that they are making something out of the patient. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, mean, you know, I haven't practiced, but that's my, that's my understanding to some extent. So it's easy to develop these. 
how many things can go wrong in a dental practice? What can go wrong? How many people amongst all these 200 odd people in your, in your group have seen an anaphylactic shock? Are we aware of how to treat an anaphylactic shock? Have we got those three, four medications which we need? That's all it is, laminate it, put it up. Every morning you go in there, look at it. Five times you look at it, seventh day, you've got it in your head. It's not gonna go anywhere. How many anticoagulant medications are the commonest ones which we are using? There's just only so many. So go through it, get it ratified, go through it. Only this takes, it's a cut and paste, unfortunately. It's plagiarism of whatever kind, but it's for good. I don't think NICE will hold, hold anyone responsible if you cut and paste it and use it to your advantage. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Salman Siddiq, uh, I think uh, the question what you have asked is already spoken. I think probably once it is loaded onto the YouTube channel, GDP YouTube channel, you can just go through that. Uh, Dr. Mubarak, I think I have finished with the questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahad, uh, pleasure, pleasure having a discussion with you. Yeah, it's you it's much. almost uh, 20 years I have you know sat on the same platform and discussed things with you. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ahad. Uh, thank you, Dr. Imran. Uh, thank, Dr. You, Mubarak, thank you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Mubarak, you know, nice is all yours. Yeah. Thank you very much for this knowledgeable um, discussion today. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Ahad. Um, and thank you, Dr. Imran. Uh, it's been a great pleasure having you both today. And uh, Nadim, thanks for taking on and passing the questions across. Um, I think without undue, I think we've taken too much time. I'm going to try and uh, conclude the session. Um, well, uh, I should apologize again for the technical glitches we had initially, but I hope we've answered all your questions and we've uh, clarified most of your doubts. If you still have any questions, any further doubts, Please put it across in our group and we would be uh, happy to take those questions and clarify with our best of abilities. Um, all those who missed the talk, you could watch it on our YouTube GDP channel. Um, it will be uploaded later on today. But uh, thank you all again and thanks for your valuable time and your knowledge. Jazakallah uh, khair. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for providing the platform. Thank you. Thank you.